Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue looking today at uh, Ellen White's endorsements of different things and what they mean and how we understand those endorsements. Obviously, it, we don't believe that it creates infallibility in what she endorses. But anyway, before we begin this study, let's uh, invite God into our presence. The dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we have here this morning, for your care and protection, and for your mercy and love towards us, and the way that you have united our hearts through Christ, uh, with you and with one another. We are so thankful, Lord, for uh, the time that we have each morning to open your word together and to receive light uh, that strengthens us and that uh, can shine forth from us to others. Be with us in this study. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts and reveal to us the truth. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again. So we were... we. We spent some time looking at David H. Thiel's criticism of of Lewis F. Weir, and, and we're done with that. Uh, we learned a lot, but one of the things that we're addressing is this idea of an endorsement. So we know that Ellen White endorses. We looked at the statements regarding uh, Smith's Daniel and Revelation, and we, we, we believe that Daniel and Revelation is – as Ellen White says, it is God's helping hand. It's a good book. It should be sold. People should read it. But does that mean that everything in it, every interpretation is without fault? And my position is that that's not the case. Now, we're going to look at some endorsements. This first endorsement we see here is, I would think, the first endorsement that Ellen White gets. She So this is Obviously, this is in 1847, I believe, that she makes this statement, and she's referring, but it could be earlier, I'm not sure, because this is in February 7th, 1846, that Brother Crozier wrote this article. So when Ellen White gives this endorsement, I'd have to look it up to see exactly what the date was. But she says, I believe the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days is the New Jerusalem temple of which Christ is a minister. The Lord show me in vision more than one year ago, that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, etc., and that it was his will that Brother Crozier should write out the view which he gave us in the Day Star Extra, February 7th. Uh, so that's more than one year ago. So that means, yes, so obviously this is 1847. She's writing this. Uh, should write out the view which he gave us in the Day Star Extra, February 7th, 1846. I feel fully authorized by the Lord to recommend that extra to every saint. So is she saying here, and does she say in any of her other endorsements, that does that mean everything would be correct? Now, we can look at some things in Crozier's article and see that there are things that Ellen White would not agree with. So uh, here, this is going to be, Crozier's article, part one of four. So I'm going to show this here. Just going to share the screen. A any comments so far about uh, the statement in th there, uh, which I just dis disappeared? Everybody was fine with that statement. It's easy to find if you look it up in E.G. White Dis. You just type in Crozier. I think there's four places his name's mentioned. Okay, so this this article here. Is going to talk about the law of Moses. Now, if you read this article and you read Ellen White's chapter in Patriarchs and Prophets and the one in Great Controversy, I believe it is, on the sanctuary, you'll find that she's she's actually using this article as an outline for her her chapters because I've compared the two. Now, I don't know of anybody who's accused her of copying Crozier, like plagiarizing him. But but often when she was writing, she would use other material to help her, you know, organize her thoughts. She's not going to quote it word for word or anything, but you can see that she follows the general outline of this article, at least parts of it. So 
He's going to go through here the commandment of this verse to remember the law of Moses is the last one of the Old Testament, given in connection with the prophetic description of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. As though, low, as, as though the law contains something further descriptive of that day. Perhaps we have paid too little attention to the law, not seeing its import in the light it was designed to shed on good things to come. Our Savior and the apostles taught from Moses, as well as the prophets, the things concerning himself. The Mosaic law is what Paul in Hebrews calls the first covenant which the Lord made with the fathers when he took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. This was not the covenant of promise, promises made with Abraham, nor does it at all affect that. This covenant of promise made by Abraham and his seed, Christ, seed, Christ was confirmed 430 years before the law was given, and no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, <clears throat> that it should make the promises of God of no effect. That's Galatians 3.17. So there's going to be lots of things in here about that, that we're going to be very familiar with. You'll see that our understanding and Crozier's understanding regarding the covenants, um, the law, the purposes of the law, uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary. It's going to go into Leviticus 16. I'm not going to like read all of this because we're very familiar with these ideas. Uh, the Sabbaths under the law typify the great Sabbath, the seventh millennium, right? So it's something that we believe. The Jubilee typifies the release and return of their possessions of all captive Israel. This cannot be fulfilled till the resurrection of the just. The autumnal types were none of them fulfilled at the first advent. So that is the fall types are fulfilled in the second advent. Uh, the legal 10th day atonement was not, neither could it be fulfilled at that time. Right. So this is something that we believe where most Christians would just say all of those things were fulfilled. All the types were fulfilled at the cross. But we see that there is spring types and the fall types. So it's something quite unique to Adventism. Uh, he was buried and arose and shed down the Holy, Holy Ghost in direct fulfillment of the types, which would not have been the case if the significancy of the law had terminated at the cross. In fact, his anointing and crucifixion were, the, were only the beginning of its fulfillment as being the beginning of that great system of redemption whose shadows were contained in the law. Now, in our Friday night studies, when we were dealing with the issue with the evangelicals, you know, this is one of the things that, that, uh, you know, M. L. Andreasen, obviously, in his book on the sanctuary, is going to focus on. But in, in the articles dealing with the evangelicals, he doesn't focus on this as much, the spring and fall types, which I think is something that uh, is a really powerful argument for, you know, the investigative judgment and the day of atonement. But, you know, that's usually fairly involved. You have to understand the sanctuary. You have to understand the cleansing of the sanctuary, the 2300 days, the 70 weeks. That's something that's, that Adventists understand, which cannot be, cannot be reconciled with the common Christian evangelical view that, you know, the day of atonement was fulfilled at the cross, right? In that, in that period of time at the first coming. Uh, all will admit that some of the types have been fulfilled and that others have not, as they are yet to be fulfilled. It becomes us to remember and study the law, to learn their nature and import. So you can see why Ellen White is going to recommend this article. It's setting forth the views that we as Seventh-day Adventists still believe today. And, and there isn't going to be a lot of fault with it, right? So he's going to deal with the sanctuary, how it's set up, and then I'm not going to read that because this, these we're all going to agree with. Where oh, so this is part two of four. So and, and we're going to deal with this being reprinted. Now it's kind of interesting here. There's part there's topic one, two, three. There's no number four in the original of uh, this uh, list. So Christ was made a high priest forever, being after the order of Melchizedek. He is priest and king, right? king and priest. King by birth, being the tribe of Judah, and priest by the oath of his father. Um, he's a 
perfect forever. He's called after the, he was not called after the order of Aaron, that is not of his, in his succession. But this does not at all prove that the priesthood of Aaron was not typical of the priesthood of Christ. So now we remember Crozier. What, what was the motivation for Crozier studying this? Does anybody know the story behind that? Why Crozier is the one who wrote this article? Does anybody know? He was involved with meeting with Hiram Edson just prior to his Edson's journey to the the cornfield, through the cornfield. So that well, he, was, was, he was with Edson. He was with Hiram Edson. Right. That's what I understand. Anybody have any information on that? Because Hiram Edson was walking with some others, and and he lagged behind when he had this this vision, right, of Christ moving from the holy to the most holy. Crozier was his friend who he was one of the persons he was walking with, if I understand it correctly. And so he began this study right after that, right? So he's going to begin looking at these things in 1844, and then he's going to publish them in February of 1846. So about a year and a half of study almost, right? Yeah. So a year and four months of study, not quite. Now, of course, James and Ellen White are also friends with Hiram Edson. And they know Crozier as well. So, so, but Crozier is going to be the one that, so Hiram Edson has the vision. Crozier is going to be the one that, that studies it and then studies the topic and then lays it out. And this is going to still be our standard view. This, there isn't really much here that's going to differ, right? So we're going to find all of these things here. Um, so I'm going to see if I can find. I, I should have looked at this earlier to find exactly where I want to go. We know that about the idea that these are the patterns shown to be in the mount. All of these ideas are going to be standard views. Now he's going to talk about uh, the daily service and the yearly service. This did not atone for sins either individually or collectively. The daily service described was a sort of continual intercession. By the making of atonement was a special work for which special directions are given. Different words are used both in the Old Testament and New to express the same idea of, as at one -ment. Now, of course, we always see this at one -ment, you know, it's just kind of a characteristic of the word atonement, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't come, that's not an etymological, atone doesn't come from the word at one, right? But, but we, we use that as an illustration. So... Um, thou shalt cleanse the altar, talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary, um, how, th how that happens on the Day of Atonement, and how that's related to cleansing us from our sins. But he says, from these texts, we learn that the words atone, cleanse, reconcile, purify, purge, pardon, sanctify, hallow, forgive, justify, redeem, blot out, and some others are used to signify the same work, and that is bringing into favor with God, and in all cases, blood is the means, and sometimes blood and water. The atonement is the great idea of the law, as well as the gospel. And as the design of that, of the law, was to teach us that the gospel, it is, teach us that of the gospel. It is very important to be understood. The atonement which the priest made for the people in connection with their daily ministration was different from that made on the tenth day of the seventh month. In making the former, they went no further than in the holy, but to make the latter, they entered the holy of holies. Right? So we know the former was made for forgiveness of sins, the latter for blotting them out. The former could be made at any time, the latter only on the tenth day of the seventh month. Hence, the former may be called the daily atonement and the latter the yearly, or the former the individual and the latter the national atonement. Now, would, would we agree with this distinction here? individual and national is so that's not something we've we've we we would i mean i other than this article i don't know of that ever reading that i would have trouble with that yeah so so there'd be some little details here we might say well you know i don't know if i agree with that right doesn't mean he's wrong and, and we're right it's just that you know there aren't things that we've heard and and maybe they make sense maybe they don't this to me doesn't really make sense. I don't think it's about individual and national. I would agree, though, the forgiveness of sins and the blotting them out would be 
better, right? So I don't know why hence the former may be called the daily atonement and the latter the yearly, that's true, or the former the individual and the latter the national. So the individual national, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take. Now, there is, of course, when we look at uh, the Day of Atonement, it is going to have, you know, it's going to have uh, all these different sin offerings. Um, you know, the priest is going to have sin offering. There's going to be a priest for the, or, or an offering for the people. You know, there's there's offerings for, and, and even in our regular uh, daily service, there's different types of offerings for different groups of people. So there's the priests, the king, right, the ruler, right, um, the uh, the people and the individual, right? And they, they all happen a little bit differently. Um, so there's different symbolism tied to that. He says here, it should be distinctly remembered that the priest did not begin his duties till he obtained the blood of the victim and that they are all were all performed in the court the enclosure of the sanctuary, and that the atonement thus made was only for the forgiveness of sins. These points are expressly taught in this chapter and the following one in the trespass offering. Here is an atonement to make, which the priests only entered the holy, and to make it they could enter that apartment always or daily. That's the word tamud, tamid. But into the second, the holy of holies, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. This affirms uh, the yearly to be. So I think he defines the author's correction, defines the yearly to be. Okay. So then he's going to talk about the national atonement. So that's what he's going to call the yearly, right? So that's the day of atonement. Okay. So I'm just going through this, picking highlights. I mean, if you see something that should be noticed, okay. So then he's going to have part three of four, the anti-type. And okay, I'm just going to read a little bit of this. This is interesting. Doesn't really particularly relate to what we're discussing, but as this legal system, which we have been considering, was only a shadow, a figure, and patterns of no value in itself, only to teach us of the nature of that perfect system of redemption, which is its body, the things themselves, which was devised in the council of heaven and is being wrought out by the only begotten of the Father. Let us, guided by the spirit of truth, learn the solemn realities thus shadowed forth. The one thing I like about this article, and, and I have gone through this article in the past, is that there's there's this very clear thinking that we see at that time in how this is communicated. It's unlike how people communicate nowadays, at least, you know, what we see in scholarly articles. And, you know, and after reading, you know, David Thiel's article, if he had written in this sort of very straightforward way, I think he might actually have noticed some of the problems with his arguments as well. So there's something about how we organize our thoughts, how we, how we present things that actually helps us in assessing them. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, that's why I find, you know, presenting like teaching Sabbath school or, you know, doing these studies um, or writing out a paper, you know, organizing my thoughts in a certain type. There's a type of organization of thoughts which can be destructive, and there's a type that can be constructive. So if I am trying to clearly communicate an idea, that is, I, I'm thinking about how do, I, how do I understand something? What is the thought process? What are the scriptures? What are the evidences for something? And also um, that I can communicate that with someone else. That will help me to see whether what I'm presenting is true or not. But in a sort of rhetorical or um, I use the word polemical, argumentative style, where I'm trying to show someone to be wrong, that is, I'm arguing against a idea, it's very easy to use, I'll use the word tricks, to 
And, and these would be, I think, these tricks with what, what we often call logical fallacies to try to convince someone, right? And, and it's, it, to me, they're all parts of deception. And so how someone writes really can show how transparent they are, how open to truth they are. And, and it can give an indication that what that person is presenting, at least they understand it and, and that the reasons that they are giving are real. Because sometimes people give arguments that I wouldn't call real arguments. That is, on the surface, they look like they're supporting them. But they know, at least on some level, that that argument is a faulty argument. But they present it anyway because they're trying to deceive. And, and of course, politicians do this all the time. We're very familiar. But all kinds of people do this. Sometimes, to... yeah. some, sometimes uh, I, I, when I'm writing something out, I have difficulty putting it in the right words. And it, for me, it, it can also be laziness. I just want to get it done. And I know it doesn't sound very clear or something that could lead one way or the other, but I just in a hurry or something. I'm not sure. It's mm-hmm. Just try, just trying to give a, give a gracious interpretation to it as well. I mean, there's a possibility, but yeah. I see what you're saying to be, uh, what's that word? malicious or in, malicious intent that's that's scary stuff yeah you know i mean we see some comments on these videos like there was a comment i commented on today on um, yesterday's video i have no idea what the guy is saying now it could be a language barrier sometimes people are actually writing it in one language and then they use google translate to translate it and then post it i'm not certain but you know, it, it doesn't seem the syntax doesn't seem very natural to an English speaker. So either he's just doesn't know English or he's using a Google translate or something. But sometimes, I mean, people just are not clear thinkers. That is there. Sometimes they have something wrong with them. That is, they have a mental illness or something and they tend to just kind of ramble and I, and I used the word in response to them that I didn't understand what he was saying. It was kind of like word salad. And I don't really like using that phrase word salad. But, but sometimes people just put a bunch of words together. And, and I don't even know that they understand what they think. Now, God can give us clear understanding. So one of the things I find is that when something is true, it's actually easier to understand it than something that's false. I don't yeah, know if that makes sense. That. Yeah, that? When it's true. It, when it's true, it rings true. Yeah, and 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 you can easily present you can present evidence for something that's true much more easily than something that's false. If you were trying to, you, you have to use deception for one thing. If something is false, right? So you have to hide things. You have to things that even a person might know. You would have to try to cover them up in some way. And, and often what you use is language, definitions of words, right? You, you play, you know, that's called equivocation, mm-hmm. where you take one meaning of a word and then you use it in another way. So you prove it is one meaning that it's true and then you use it another way. And people can notice these things, like things don't make sense. So there's I some... It, about, I, what's that? I, notice when a, I notice when a word is misused uh, and people get frustrated with me sometimes because I'm like, Okay, well, what does that mean? Let's let's look at that word just itself, and and they get frustrated because they're they're in a I don't know they think I'm being too particular, but really, language is how does it go? The limitations of our language limits our world. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of philosophy dealing with how language, how we uh, speak, and and the words we have, how they shape our thinking, and that's why. Um, um, A.T. Jones of the Bible in Education and uh, another book by um, Sutherland on on the Bible in Education. I can't remember what his book is called. But one of the things that they teach is that, you know, the first thing a child should learn to read is the Bible. And and that, 
you know, the words that come from the Bible, their first associations with learning to read those words and to understand language is going to be associated with the Bible. So with uh, my oldest kids, especially, they were raised with uh, the Bible. I mean, they listened to Alexander Scorby reading the King James Version over and over. Yeah, and yeah. wore those tapes out. Well, I don't know if they quite wore them out, but yeah, they, I know. So to my, speak, my, turn a phrase. Yeah, my oldest son Matt, when he was five, he had the Book of Isaiah memorized because he really liked the Book of Isaiah. Um, amazing. I remember you reading to the children the scriptures you know, and uh, just seeing that. It was so neat. Yeah. Because they sat there and they listened in rapture to it. Just totally yeah. listening. Yeah. My, my, my older boys, you know, Matt, Joe, and Mike, they all loved me reading to them. I, I ended up working a lot more when the younger kids were around. So I didn't spend as much time with them as the older ones. But, uh, yeah, I, I do believe that the power of of learning the Bible and learning language and learning to read the Bible um, is is important. So language has this ability. Well, Christ is the word, right? <laughs> so, so words are very important. And Satan is a deceiver. He He misuses language, right? And so we have to be careful that when we speak, we have to have our yay be yay and our nay be nay. We have to speak. Okay, so Stephen says, Spalding wrote that Crozier's study was first published five months after the disappointment in the day, day dawn, but it was never had much impact until it's published in the day star. Okay, okay, interesting information there. So it was published... Um, so March then, probably March or maybe April depends. You know, it says five months out. Yeah, probably March though. Okay, so um, so he's going to continue talking about the the two two compartments, the two veils. Hebrews six for this is an interesting one. Hebrews six verse nineteen to twenty is supposed to prove that Christ entered the holy of holies at his accession, accession, ascension. Pardon me. Because Paul said he had entered within the veil. But the veil which divides between the holy and the holies is the second veil. Um, in Greek, that's the Deuteron Kapimatasma. Let me see. Try, you know, I don't usually say the word out loud. Katapatasma. That katapatasma is the veil, and Deuteron is the second veil. So, in Hebrews 9, verse 3, hence there are two veils. And that in Hebrews 6, being the first of which he speaks, must be the first veil, which hung before the holy. And in Exodus, it was called a curtain. So he's saying it's the first one that he's going to mention. So it's going to be the first veil. And then he's going to talk about the second veil later. When he entered within the veil, he enters entered his tabernacle, of course, the holy as that was the first apartment and our hope as an anchor of the soul enters within the veil, uh, the atonement of both apartments, including both the forgiveness and blotting out of sins. Now we could actually look at that anchor and there's a little study you can do from Isaiah uh, 22, starting to think at verse 20 or something like that, where it talks about a nail in a sure place and which is referring to the sanctuary. So often what people, um, people don't, you know, when we think about an anchor there, we think about a ship's anchor, but it's actually referring to like a nail, a type of anchor when you anchor something to a wall, not like a ship's anchor. Um, but it's, it's actually a reference to Isaiah 22. So, you know, a lot of these little details, uh, people don't pick up on. Um, then, um, so he's going to deal with some of the the ideas of on, upon their theory, the sanctuary of the new covenant was cleansed in the early part of the gospel dispensation. Right now, we have some obviously the idea that the sanctuary was cleansed under the seventy weeks doesn't make sense. 
right? The fact that those days which reach 810 days beyond the 70 weeks, that the sanctuary should not be cleansed till the end of those days is demonstration that the antitype of the legal 10th day is not the gospel dispensation. Again, if the atonement of that day is typical of the atonement of the gospel dispensation, then the atonement made in the holy, Hebrews 9, 6, previous to that day was finished before the gospel dispensation began. Um, it has been shown that atonement was made for the forgiveness of sins, and I have found no evidence that such an atonement was made on the 10th day of the seventh month. The gospel dispensation began with the preaching of Christ, and if it is the antitype of the legal 10th day, one of the two things is true. Either the Savior, instead of fulfilling, has destroyed the greater part of the law, the daily service of the holy, which occupies the whole year except one day and the 10th of the seventh month, or else he fulfilled the whole law except one 360th part of it before the gospel dispensation began and before he was anointed as the Messiah to fulfill the law and the prophets. Right. So he's just saying that there's an inconsistency in the, those types of arguments um, that, that are being made by other Christians. One of these two conclusions conclusions is inevitable on the hypothesis that the gospel dispensation and the atonement made in it is the antitype of the legal 10th day and the atonement made in it, upon which of these horns will they hang? If on the former, the declaration, I came not to destroy the law, pierces them. But if they choose the latter, it then becomes them to prove that the law, which had a shadow of good things to come, was fulfilled within itself, that the shadow and substance filled the same place and time. Also, they will need to prove that the entire atonement for the forgiveness of sins was made before the Lamb was slain, with whose blood the atonement was to be made. Now, I don't know these arguments. Are, are, I don't know if they're good arguments. But um, you can see that these would be the, consistent to some degree with what we believe. I mean, I, I would probably argue this a little bit differently. Okay. Uh, now, it must be clear to everyone that if the antitype of the yearly service began in the, at the first advent, the antitype of the daily had been previously fulfilled. Um, and as the atonement for forgiveness was part of that daily service, they are involved in the conclusion that there has been no forgiveness of sins under the gospel dispensation. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I would really use that argument. But again, they say the atonement was made and finished on Calvary when the Lamb of God expired. So men have taught us, and so the churches and world believe, but it is none the more true or sacred on that account, if unsupported by divine authority. Perhaps few or none who hold the opinion have ever tested the foundation on which it rests. If the atonement was made on Calvary, by whom was it made? Uh, the making of the atonement is the work of a priest, right? So, of course, we know that Christ is both the offering, he's also the priest. So some of these arguments are a bit more like literalistic arguments. They're sort of kind of the arguments that we saw when we were looking at E.J. Wagner when he rejects the investigative judgment and the cleansing of the sanctuary. And I, and I don't think it's best to, to put an argument in this sort of, you have this choice and this choice, because there are other choices. So sometimes we call this a false dichotomy. When you, when you lay out, well, you have this choice and you have this choice, which is correct, when sometimes there are other modifications that can be made. Um, but anyway, we're, we're not going to really find a lot of fault with this. Okay, so it's going to be, I believe, in the fourth part that we're going to find. Now, one of the things um, just to dealing with, because uh, I saw there, you know, talks about the age to come. And we see all these things like the day dawn, and the day star. A lot of what ended up happening with uh, other churches that formed from the Millerite history. You're going to have um, Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, come out of Millerite history. There was all kinds of after, after the disappointment in 1844. Uh, we have lots of different groups that arise, right? We have what we call the first day Adventists, the Advent Christian Church. Um, you have, of course, Seventh day Adventists come out of that. Um, but there was all kinds of other groups that were trying to make sense out of what had happened in the Millerite history. And 
um, Samuel Snow himself is going to really be creating his own movement. You're going to have, um, you know, James and Ellen White, but you're going to have uh, Crozier, others, and and these are going to, they, they're all publishing these publications, these different papers that are going to have different following and they're going to uh, affect different people. And do we see a parallel in this history with this movement after July 18, 2020, and, and even before? So, of course, we have Amen. our group that splits off. Yeah. Amen. And, and even with the uh, thing with uh, Trump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, the question is and that, that I've asked myself thousands of times ever since I first started, you know, studying the Bible. It's how do I know what is true? And there are so many voices uh, vying for our attention, so many people who want us to listen to them. And, you know, and some, some people spend a lot of time watching lots of different videos, and I'm not saying that's wrong or anything, but often they're inconsistent with each other. That is, there are so many voices within Adventism. And sometimes, you know, there, there's videos I watch, and they have some really good stuff. And then... You know, I watch the next video and it's like total fanaticism. Like, why is this happening? Um, and one is we know that Satan uses truth and mixes it with error to make error more palatable, but also um, so that people will throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? So that people will reject the truth because it because it's been misused. So they will just see the error that's been attached to it. And so, you know, we, we stand in this study group here as, as a group that professes to believe that we have the truth to some degree, right? We know that we obviously need to be corrected, but we believe that we're following the counsel that was given on what we are to do. That is how we are to study, how do we, how we are to approach understanding what happened in the past, how God has led us in the past, and how he's going to continue to lead us. Doesn't mean that everything that we say is correct. We could be wrong about lots of things that we need to be corrected in. But we believe that the approach that we're using is that which is approved of by God. That's We're following the counsel given. And when people who aren't following that counsel condemn us, and misrepresent what we're doing that that's that's a sign we should keep doing what we're doing <laughs> right and and that they're mm -hmm. probably not doing that correctly so we can stand sort of in judgment of the fact that there are things that we could be doing if we were doing like other people that is if we were constantly condemning other people you know making them out to be heretics misrepresenting what they're teaching uh, saying have no fellowship with them, all that type of stuff, we would be on the wrong side just as they. So the reason, the thing that makes uh, James and Ellen White, why their movement ends up accepting the truth, has to do with their whole approach. One is they want to be directed by God, and they weren't doing like Snow and, and others, drawing people to themselves. Even though we have lots of criticisms of James and Ellen Wright, of what they were doing, but we see that if you look at the criticisms, that they're false, right? People had to lie in order to try to counteract what James and Ellen Wright were doing. That is, they had to misrepresent both the message and the messengers, correct? Taking Adam and making a world of it. Yeah. If somebody's teaching error, it's pretty simple. You present the truth. You don't have to, to lie to show that somebody's wrong. Right? No, truth does that. Yeah. And, and so you don't have to misrepresent their character. You don't have to, you know, um, uh, Focus misrepresent on their character. Yeah. Or, or even. And misrepresent what they're teaching. In order to disprove it, you can you can clearly show what they're teaching and show why it's wrong, right? But but when when people are preaching truth, 
You can't do that. You, you can't use truth to show that somebody's in error when they are preaching truth. Right? You have to use error. You have to use lies. And, and that to me has been one of the, I guess, the, the filters that I've been able to use through the years. You know, there's, there's other filters as well. Obviously, comparing scripture with scripture and looking at the scriptures themselves. Right. One, but when one I see take... somebody attacking another person, I'm much more mm. leery in listening to what they're saying. Yeah, Kelly. Mm. Yeah, it's the wrong spirit. Puts me on edge right away. Um, yeah, wh- one of the one of the experiences I had in this it was uh, 2005. There was I'd always just accepted that Christ that the daily was Christ's ministry taken away. Mm-hmm. I'd never really studied it, and then it came up in a in the great controversy forum. So then I saw, oh, there's two different ways to look at it. I wonder which one's right. And each person was vying for their position. And I just put it aside and I started looking at it myself. And I I came to it the conclusion that yeah, the daily is paganism and it made so much sense. It 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 just rang through. It lined up with the my understanding of prophecy as limited as it was even at that time so it's important for us to be able to weigh the evidence on both sides and that uh, that helps us gu- help while well, the holy spirit's then able to take it that and guide us through that process and give witness to our hearts and our minds that it's true mm-hmm. yeah and Yes, spending the time, like I know when the daily uh, first came to me, like it was a Jeff Pippinger article that the Sharmans gave me, and I didn't understand it at all because I was so steeped in the idea that the daily refers to Christ's heavenly ministry that and I just had never heard of the view that the daily was paganism. So it took me some time. So basically that was 2007, I think, when I... Uh, read that article. It wasn't until 2000, probably 2011, that I finally understood the pioneer view of the daily. So um, I'm trying to find here uh, antitypical daily. What is this? Um, I'm trying to find the statement that he makes dealing with uh, the daily service. And You're just telling just how important the proper understanding of it is as well as this new thing of uh, Daniel 12, the 1290 and the 1335. You just get that totally wrong. And if you, it, with the proper understanding, you, you can't make it a future application. Yeah. Yeah. Or a literal days or so on. What's going on? Mm-hmm. Like one conversation I was having with a, with a friend was they were using 538 and adding those 1290 and 1335 to 538, and they're getting 18-something. or It was kind of a little bit, quite a bit off, and they couldn't understand why it wasn't adding up on the calculator. And uh, even I tried it, and I went, oh, yeah, no, 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 it's 5, 508. There's that 30-year period yeah. that uh, the daily was taken away. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm trying to find this here, but um, I should have I should have found it earlier because the idea is here that he's going to be talking about um, the daily in is not being paganism, but it's Christ's ministry, and I can't find it. So, um, boy, his whole name was Owen Russell Loomis Crozier. 1820 to 1913. It says here, uh, this is just on the internet. In 1847, 1847, he anticipated the new view of the daily. And um, he taught the doctrine of the millennium, the age to come, opposed by Adventists. That's in 1850. So it says, a view foreshadowed only partly in one section of his sanctuary article in 1846. I want to find that section. I think this might be the section. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I find it here. Just hang on. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm reading something here just online. It says, several writers have suggested that O.R.L. Crozier interpreted the Tamid as Christ's continual high priestly ministry in heaven, based on his article in the Daystar Extra from February 7th, 1846. By interpreting the sanctuary and its cleansing as the heavenly sanctuary that he had to, that had to be cleansed after the 2300 evening mornings with Christ, serving as the great high priest, Crozier deviated from the major Millerite view. Obviously, the Millerite view was the sanctuary as the earth. While he argued in several of his articles for an extended atonement in a true heavenly uh, sanctuary, none of the mentioned articles makes explicit statements in regard to the Talmud. Crozier did, however, present his views on the Talmud in March 19th, 1847, edition of the Day Dawn, which was apparently been overlooked by most researchers in the past. He ranked the true understanding of the daily sacrifice and the sanctuary among the fundamental principles he and others had discovered. So, so it's in this, uh, so is it going to be, I'm just trying, well, let's read what he says here. So see if we can find this. Paul, after speaking of the daily services in the holy and the yearly in the holy of holies, says Hebrews 9, verse 8, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holies, now he has Hadon, Hagion, it's actually Hagon, Hagion, Haga, Hagion, I'm not sure what the Hadon is. Anyway, it was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing which is a figure of the time then present for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and a high priest of the good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands by his own blood, he entered into on or into the holy things. Uh, that is Hagia. Uh, the phrase or S S Hagia verse 12 so in the, so here he's, he's translating this. He, that's Hebrews 8 verse 12 he says, he entered once into the holy place. The phrase which he has here is as Hagia. Verse 12 is the same that is rendered holy places, verse 24. Uh, Hagia in these two verses is in um, the accusative plural neuter and governed by the preposition is, which signifies on, into, upon, or among. Hagia being a neuter adjective is properly rendered holy things, but Hagia in verse 2 is in the nominative singular feminine and properly rendered holy place. The definite article the belonging before good things in verse 11 in Hebrews 10.1 makes the expression means things good in themselves or abstractly good. Now, I've never heard that argument before. And even here in this type of, of argument, I, I think that there are some problems with how he's interpreting uh, the Greek. Now, I know me and Iran have a little bit different view about some of these verses in Hebrews uh, chapter 9 and 10 about translating this. Now, one of the things that the reason I actually went to university, so the reason I went to university was learn Hebrew and Greek because I had studied them on my own and I wasn't doing a very good job of it. So I figured if I go to university, I can take these languages and, and get better at them. And the reason I wanted to get better at them is I wanted to evaluate some of the claims regarding the book of Hebrews. That is, I believe, I believe then, and I still believe that the book of Hebrews was not written in Greek, that it was written in Hebrew. Now, why would I say the book of Hebrews would be written in Hebrew? What, what, what would be uh, just a straightforward way to say why it would be written in Hebrew and not in Greek? The title? Because, because it was a letter that was being written to other Jews in Rome. Right. So why would you write it in Greek? And there's all uh, kinds of he Hebraisms in the book of Hebrews. It's also in a different style than other of Paul's letters which could be explained if it was written in Hebrew and then translated into Greek, right? So, so there's more Hebraisms in it than in Paul's other letters. And, and so some people say, well, Paul didn't write the book of Hebrews. We know, of course, that he did. L. White says he did. And, and that was pretty much the United Testimony in the past. Plus also that the book of Hebrews was written in Hebrew was a common view. 
And so I spent a lot of time looking into that. Um, uh, John Owen, uh, uh, a Puritan author, one of my favorite Puritan authors, probably my favorite is Puritan author. And he wrote uh, a commentary in the book of Hebrews. And the first volume is just the introduction. And he addresses this whole issue. And so, so I believe the book of Hebrews was written in Hebrew. And, and, and the Greek translation gets some things wrong. And so one of it is the terms dealing with the holy place. And, and so they tend to have the plural written as a singular and the singular written as a plural, which doesn't make sense. And whether we have the original Hebrew or not, we have the Peshitta, which is Aramaic. And, uh, and that is possible that that, that is, uh, you know, closer to what Paul originally wrote. But anyway, if Ellen White is endorsing this article, does that mean we would have to accept Crozier's explanation of the Greek is, is my question. Which one was it where the, it was published and then republished, but James and Ellen White edited out the part that was. Yes, that's this article. So this article originally, James White published it with the offending passages regarding uh, the daily. And then when he republished it, he took those, that, that section out. So that's going to be 1850 that it's going to be published. That's a little um, known history that's quite important. Yeah. So some people make the argument though that, um, because he originally put in the offending passages or paragraph or whatever, then, you know, that means that he believed the new view of the daily. That James and Ellen yes. White supported that, and and that she gave the endorsement of this, which had the seeds of the new view of the daily. This this sounds like a typical argument that the uh, what is it the original books people like to use, perhaps. You mm. know, they say, well, it was written originally like that and then changed, so we need to use yeah. the original. Yeah. yeah. So, so when we think about about especially the new view of the daily. So, I mean, we're not we're studying that right now, but we, we have studied it in the past. Now, was there a problem with the old view of the daily? The like, old view is the right view. Well, it? okay. I mean, it, I mean, depends it, what you I mean. mean. Te- technically. Right. So the, is there problems with the old view? Well, there is some problems. One is, did they understand the heavenly sanctuary aspect of Christ's ministry? They don't appear to, right? The cleansing of the no. sanctuary is going to be addressed. That, that, under, that understanding came later. Like right. when I say the old view, it's like pre-Millerite even, isn't it? No. The old view is the, the Millerites is, uh, Miller's view is unique. Nobody ever had that. Okay. I thought it was, uh, people, like, uh, you know, prior to 1844, people from all the churches were joining the movement. And that wasn't held by other churches? No. no okay. Thank it's you for that. It's a unique view that the mm-hmm. daily is paganism and the abomination of desolation is papalism. Nobody had that view. just doesn't exist. I've, I've never seen any evidence that it does, at least. You know, maybe there's somebody somewhere who believed it but never wrote it down or published it, or if they did, it doesn't exist. Definitely it was, it, it is where uh, Miller tries to figure this out, taken away, and then he's going to use Second uh, Thessalonians chapter two. And so then he says, well, what was taken away? You know, that was paganism, right? Nobody held that view. The two desolating powers was not understood by anybody. So why so, do they call it the old view? It's because it, the new it's view. The Millerite view. Yeah. Compared, compared to the new view, which is that the daily is Christ's heavenly ministry. And where exactly are, did that come in then? The, the new, new view? view? Yeah. In, in the early 20th century. Okay. Like the beginning of okay. the 1900s. All right. So that was and the new view. Oh, okay, that's what it is. The new view is actually the old Protestant view. 
like did Protestants before the Millerites hold that the Christ that Christ sanctuary was the daily? Is that how? That's why I'm thinking yeah. it's the old. No. no. Well, no. what did they think that the daily was? Did they? There must be something. The, da the daily was um, the daily sacrifice, just the 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 sacrifices of of the animals. Right. That's what that's what the Protestants thought before Miller. Yeah. So that's why that's I cool. call it so the, the, old, so, the old view. Yeah. So when we look, because it's it's going to be the daily is going to be dealing with the Tychus Epiphanies, right? The abomination of desolation is going to be a Tychus Epiphanies. Right. Before right. Miller. Yeah. So the new view. The reason why it came into Adventism is because there was problems with Miller's view of the daily. That is, Miller's view of the daily didn't take into account that there is this heavenly sanctuary ministry. So, so there needs to be an adaption to take that into account. Now, the way that, that I understand it is if we understand that the daily is the counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary, then we can understand the abomination of desolation, that is, the papacy, is a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary ministry of Christ. But that would not have been understood by Miller, right? He wouldn't have understood that it's a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary of Christ. He would understand that it's papalism, but not that it's a counterfeit of Christ's heavenly ministry, because he's not addressing Christ's heavenly ministry. Does that make sense? What is he addressing? He was just addressing the daily was paganism and the abomination of desolation is papalism, these two desolating powers, right? He's not addressing that what they're a counterfeit of. He never talks about the daily being a counterfeit of Christ's earthly ministry for 1260 days, right? And papalism being a counterfeit of Christ's heavenly ministry for 1260 days. 60 days, right? For years. You understand what I'm saying? That even yes. though we talk about the new desolating powers, paganism and papalism, he never attached to them the parallel with the week of Christ. And that they were counterfeits of the week of Christ. He just didn't have that information. Does that make sense? Yeah, I follow that. Okay. So so because we had this new view in the sanctuary that Miller never had, then we have to incorporate that into our understanding of the two desolating powers. But that wasn't happening. And so in, um, you know, 1857 when, uh, or 1856, when, um, um, Hiram Edson is going to publish his articles on the times of the Gentiles. The church had an opportunity to, to preempt the new view of the day by, by understanding the two desolating powers as these two 1260s. So you could say the new view of the day we came about because of the failure to receive light in regard to the 2520 or the rejection of the 2520, open the door to the new view of the daily. Does that make sense to people? One more time. Okay. What opens we, in the, we, had never the door? we had never incorporated the new understanding of the sanctuary, that it's in heaven and that Christ is our minister in the heavenly sanctuary. We never incorporated that into our understanding of the 2520, right? Because we reject the 2520. So, so we never did that. So something had to be done with the idea that Christ's heavenly ministry is the, dealing with the cleansing of the sanctuary. So the new view of the daily is a flawed attempt to incorporate the idea that Christ is in the sanctuary in heaven as our high priest. And then looking back at, because we reject a type kiss of epiphanies as having to do with the daily, right? You know, and the abomination of desolation. He's not the abomination of desolation. 
But because we have this new view on the sanctuary, we have to do something with it. And because we reject the 2520, that opens the door for the new view of the daily to come in and fill that void. Right? It's a false view, but it's a false view because we have rejected the 2520. It's just another way that shows the importance of the 2520. We saw that as we went through Daniel's last vision, that, you know, if Smith had understood the two 1260s, he wouldn't have made the mistakes that he did. It reminds me of drawing the line out of the 2520 when I was trying to, trying to study with the, with the pastors or at the church where I was going to and, and him looking at it on the board and going, that's really good. I wish I could use that in an evangelistic series. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so so we can see that the rejection of light leads to the acceptance of error. And now, when, when we're dealing here with Crozier's article, there, he's making some first attempts to address... Christ is our high priest, right? Now, he doesn't address the 2520, right? That that light just doesn't come to them. And if he had understood the two desolating powers, uh, it would have been very, very powerful. But it just wasn't, wasn't the time to understand those things. I believe those things were intentionally hidden in Millerite history to be unfolded and understood in our time. But the whole purpose of this movement is the unsealing of the seven thunders, which is the understanding of Millerite history. Intentionally, meaning God put his hand over it? Yes. God put his hand over it. He, he put his hand over the 1863 chart, just as he did with the 1843 chart, I believe. That is, in 1863, the 2520 prophetic mirror is going to be hidden. And it's going to be in the top right-hand corner of the 1863 chart, just as it was in the 1843 chart, in the week of Christ. So it's the week of Christ that becomes this key that has never fully been understood by Adventism. And it's this week of Christ that unfolds everything, even in Millerite history. Because when we look at Samuel Snow's letters, and he's going to have his his understanding of the midst of the week, which he's going to publish on May 2nd, 1844, which is going to deal with Christ being crucified in the midst of the week. And it's going to actually be exactly in the middle of the writing of his first letter and the publication of his last letter before uh, uh, Boston, right? So he's going to have from February 16th to July 18th, 1844. The center of that is going to be the Passover, the true Passover, May 2nd, when he publishes about the Passover in 31 AD, where Christ is crucified in the midst of the week, which is a chiasm, and it's going to be in the middle of a chiasm that he publishes that letter without his knowledge that that's happening, of course, and he had no control over that as well. So so there's, there's a truth that God has revealed to this movement that is extremely profound and ties together all kinds of threads um, in Adventist history, in Adventist understanding, in Bible truths, that that somehow the movement, even though we we unfolded Millerite history, the vast majority of the movement has rejected that unfolding of Millerite history. That's one of the things, the, the big mistake that Jeff has made in rejecting July 18th and and the symbolic use of numbers and dates and so forth is that basically the truth. That, that he's going to reject is Ezra 7 9, right? That is going to be the error that comes in that, that sets everything in motion. And that's why he said, you know, no new light came after uh, 2012. So because it's going to be in the spring of 2013 so that, that Ezra 7 9 opens up. And so Jeff yeah. isn't going to be talking about the wonders of Ezra 7 9 anymore. Right. I haven't seen it in his art. Inter- and also interesting how, what was it? Was it who was it again that uh, first brought it to his attention? Well, that's going to be uh, Emiliano. 
Emiliano, yeah, and how how far astray he's gone since then. It's people that can bring truth, new light. Yeah, well, it's just just amazes me. I just don't know what to say when I'm, I'm lost for words. Well, it should always. I mean, be- I've seen it in my own life. You know, having so much so much light and yet going off well, into darkness for a period. Mm-hmm. Well, it's always a warning to us. It's always a warning to us. It should be a warning to us. You know, because I see it so many times where somebody gets some light and now they're a prophet and everybody needs to listen to them. And that's just ridiculous. Right. Just because God gives me light doesn't make me an authority and doesn't make me infallible. And it doesn't mean that I am a prophet or anything like that. God gives light to whoever he's going to give it. Right. And but people think because they have light that somehow you know, they now have authority, and that's just not the case. As well as other people look at people who have light and then after that follow everything that they say is being light. Yeah, well, that's, you know, and, and I can even think of it like, uh, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I've talked to many Jehovah's Witnesses, and I always ask them, well, what, what's, why are you a Jehovah's Witness if they weren't raised one, right? And and almost invariably, they point to the state of the dead, that that was the doctrine Interesting. Interesting. That, that convinced them that Jehovah's Witnesses were correct. It was, now, I remember when I studied with Jehovah's Witnesses and I accepted the state of the dead, it was through Jehovah's Witnesses that I actually accepted it before I was an Adventist. So, it, you know, Levine and I had studied with uh, concordance that Bob and Linda had as Sveen gave it to them. I'm talking to Kelly. Kelly, know who Zed Sveen is. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So he gave Bob a concordance, and Levine and I were living in Bob and Linda's basement. So, um, so we borrowed the concordance, and we looked up everything dealing with what the Jehovah's Witnesses were saying about the state of the dead. We looked up hell, the grave, soul, spirit, you know, all those words. And we were convinced that they were correct about the state of the dead. And then I use the concordance also to compare the scriptures dealing with, you know, who Christ is, Jehovah and all that. And I came to the conclusion they were wrong about Christ, that Christ wasn't a created being. So I didn't agree with them on that idea. So that was before I was even a Sabbath keeper. And then shortly after that, I started keeping the Sabbath because of Herbert W. Armstrong's radio program, The World Tomorrow. Um, And then I got invited to an Adventist church by... uh, a friend there, I just can't think of his name offhand. Anyway, and then I got baptized the next time I went to church. But th- but the point here is that, uh, you know, we have people who can believe something that's true, you know, one thing that's true that can attract a person to uh, the truth. But it doesn't mean that that person has all the truth or that church, right? So Jehovah's Witnesses use truth to attract Nor- people. Norman, you're thinking of. Yeah. Norman Byers. Yeah. In a health food health food store, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, uh we go we met him at the health food store because we'd always buy this mountain high care of ice cream. As soon as they got it in, we'd buy all of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's froze, froze, you know, frozen, we just put it in our freezer. But um uh so that's how we got to know him and then he invited us to church. So there's a longer story about it and everything. But anyway, the thing is, people can have the truth. Satan will will use truth to attract people. So just because, you know, Adventists have some things that are true, doesn't mean that everything that the Adventist church teaches is true, right? Like just you wouldn't have that as a rule just because oh they have something true then i'm going to just accept everything you need to examine every single point to decide whether it's true or not right well, that's why one of the questions that troubles me uh well are you seventh day adventist and assuming that they won't listen unless you are or it comes from a seventh day adventist source yeah, so it's got to have the imprimatur of the church in order to... Imprimatur, the seal of the Pope. Yeah, okay. So anyway, we're going to read a little bit more of Crozier here. We'll see if we run into this. I might have to get this, find the exact offending paragraph. 
maybe set that up for tomorrow. But those who hold that Christ entered the Holy of Holies, the second apartment at and has been ministering therein ever since his ascension, also believe, as of course they must, that the day that the atonement of the gospel dispensation is the antitype of the atonement made on the 10th day of the seventh month under the law. If this is so, the events of the legal 10th day have had their antitypes during the gospel dispensation. The first advent in the atonement service of that day was the cleansing of the sanctuary, as we have seen from Leviticus 16. Then upon their theory, the sanctuary of the new covenant was cleansed in the early part of the gospel dispensation. Evidence is not wanting that neither the earth nor Palestine, their sanctuaries, was then cleansed. I call them their sanctuaries, for they are not the Lord's. But if the Lord's new covenant sanctuary was then cleansed, the 2300 days ended then. But if they are years, which we all believe, they extend to 18, 10 years beyond the 70 weeks. And the last of those weeks was the first of the new covenant or gospel dispensation. So dealing with this cleansing in the sanctuary, obviously, uh, many Christians in that day would have said, I, I tie kiss epiphanies. He's going to defile the sanctuary and then for a year and a half, because the 2300 days is going to be 1000 and how many? It's half of 23. Yeah. So what? 17. Right. So it's, it's going to be, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how long a period of time they say it is, how many days and then how long that is. Is it going to say 2300 evening. evenings, mornings? So they're going to say, well, you don't count it that way. So let me see how oh, what's my computer doing. Yeah, so it's going to be, yeah, 1,150 days, right? And then if you divide that by 365.25, you're going to have 3.1485284 uh, years. So it's going to be three years and 54 and a quarter days is you know that that's what 2300 evenings and mornings would be if you put it into a solar year so so that's what they try to do is they try to take this period of three years from when the sanctuary is defiled to when it's cleansed but it doesn't work out anyway uh, you can't get that to work okay now um Okay, it has been shown the atonement was made for forgiveness of sins, and I found no evidence that such atonement was made on the 10th day of the seventh month. Okay. So he talks here about the daily service of the holy, which occupies the whole year except one day. Okay, so dealt with this. He's going to deal with the blotting out of sins. So that's going to happen at the end of the day of atonement. So the age to come. The identity of the times of restitution with the dispensation of the fullness of times, Ephesians 1.10, is also apparent as Peter in Acts 3 presents the two cardinal points in the atonement, conversion present and blotting out of future sins. Um, so Paul in his epistle to the Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. At the same time, we receive the Holy Spirit of promise, the earnest the earnest is like a down payment of our inheritance, verses 13 and 14, which make makes known to us the mystery of his will, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together all things, on or by Christ, on in or by Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. The gathering is the future object of hope, the same as the redemption, deliverance procured by the payment of a ransom, of the purchased possession. Verse 14, the things to be gathered are, are in heaven and earth. And a kept fellows signifies to bring or reduce back again under one head. That is, the different and sundered parts of the kingdom, capital and kingdom in heaven, and the subjects and territory on earth are to be redeemed or gathered again, again into one kingdom under one head of the son of David. And the dispensation of the fullness of times is the period in which it is to be done. This is the period of inheritance and follows that of the dispensation of grace. In it, the promises of the covenants in their largest sense will be inherited. We think it has been shown that the atonement of the gospel dispensation is the antitype of that made by the priests in their daily service. 
and that prepared for and made necessary the yearly atonement and cleansed the sanctuary and the people from all their sins, it appears like certainty that the empty types of the daily ministration of the priests and the vernal types stretch through the gospel's dispensation as that composed but one or but part of the atonement and antitypes. We have good reason to believe that the remaining antitype, the autumnal, and the remainder of the atonement, the yearly, we will, will be fulfilled on the same principle as to time and occupy a period or dispensation of at least a thousand years. Okay, so what is he saying here? And would we agree with this? What is he saying? I didn't quite follow all that. Yeah, it, it's a little hard to follow. So he's just saying, obviously, we have the daily represents the work of that the high priest did in the daily. It's 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 a a type of the gospel dispensation. That's the type of atonement of the gospel dispensation. That's the daily service. And then it made necessarily the yearly atonement where the sanctuary would be cleansed. And uh, that the antitypes of the daily ministration of the priests and the vernal types, that's the spring types, stretch through the gospel dispensation. Is that composed but part of the atonement and types? And we have good reason to believe the remaining antitype, the autumnal, and the remainder of the atonement, the yearly, will be fulfilled on the same principle as to time and occupy a period of dispensation or dispensation of at least a thousand years. Do we believe that the thousand years is where the fall type is fulfilled. So he seems to be saying, and I'm not sure I fully understand him, but that 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 the thousand years in a sense begins in 1844. That it's somehow connected. Now remember, this is just shortly after the disappointment. So he's not looking at the investigative judgment and and all that's going to happen. He doesn't have that doctrine yet nailed down. Does that make sense? So we wouldn't we wouldn't agree with this statement. No, oh, it's the first I've heard that idea. Yeah. You think? yeah. So so Ellen White endorses this article, but you you can't say that every single thing in it is then true. That that's basically the argument we're making. Okay. So we'll come back to this tomorrow. Um, I'll, I'll find the actual statement that I want to find <laughs> um, that we can deal with where we would say that definitely Ellen White doesn't agree with it. But we can find lots of things that we wouldn't agree with in this article. But remember, it's just really the first writing out of these ideas. And and obviously some of the arguments you know, are going to be weak and some of them faulty. Like they're going to be wrong. Right? That's just natural. and And so we could apply that to other things that Ellen White endorses, but that doesn't mean that they're that we have to accept them 100 percent. Anyway, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? OK, dear Father in heaven, we ask for your care and protection today and that you can help us in our personal study uh, to understand these things. We pray for one another. We know, Lord, that we all face challenges and um, we ask that uh, you can work in our lives and uh, in the lives of those around us. Help us to trust in you in spite of what we think and feel and see. Help us to have correct thoughts, uh, to know that you love us and care for us. And we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.